Hello and welcome to this video. My name is Fernando Ramos. I'm professor for media studies at the University of Leipzig in Germany. I'm going to take over the next two tutorials. Uh, both of them have introductory value. As you may already know, uh, these pre-recorded contents deal mainly with practical aspects of uh, filmmaking and regarding the use of audiovisual materials in history classes. My goal in these first two chapters is, however, to offer you a broader theoretical frame uh, that should help us put those practical material into a more general perspective. In the first of these two short videos, I would like to make some general remarks regarding the way history looks on uh, audiovisual content, mainly cinema, and how the relation between both fields, cinema and uh, history, shapes our knowledge of the past. In the next one, I'm going to focus mainly on the type of audiovisual content you are going to develop yourself, the so-called uh, um, historical documentary film, in order to make some general considerations regarding the main techniques that can be used in its production. So let's move on then and start addressing the quite complex relation between history and film. History's special affinity with film is nearly as old as the medium itself and started already at the end of the 19th century. However, this hasn't been an easy relationship. Even when, as in the last 40 years, an increasingly big group of um, scholars, media and film scholars mainly, uh, have successfully argued for an opening up of their disciplines and the necessity to think about cinema in a more complex, in a more demanding way. Uh, they see film as a source, but also as an agent and a product of history, interacting with history. Uh, but it still exists a basic, a basic mistrust on the part of historians as regards the function of audiovisual materials in that discipline. Concerning cinema, that stands for other audiovisual contents, uh, historians have usually tended to, put, uh, put, sorry, to point out its flaws and its inconveniences uh, from a historic historiographical perspective. Uh, historical epics were often anachronistic, inaccurate or plain wrong that dramaturgy, a victim of Hollywood conventions, uh, documentary films were often uh, characterized as simplistic. The bottom line of all this criticism was audiovisual representations of history were not able to convey the complex, the nuance, the qualified and the critical dimensions of written historical thinking about Events, events in the past. Of course, there is some th truth uh, to these claims. The audiovisual language has its own limits, which makes its historiographical use sometimes a little bit problematic. Uh, but it also possesses some qualities in its own that could also help uh, complement traditional written history. And anyway, will it not not? Ready or not, for the last decades, the historical audiovisual world has been making its impact, impact upon us. And by us, I mean uh, normal film and television audiences, uh, but also the most serious of professional historians. So it is time that we begin to take it seriously. On a more general level, uh, it is clear that the interpretation of political and contemporary uh, historical events is currently and will increasingly continue to be carried out via audiovisual media. Document documentary photography, uh, film and television flank historiography, while at the same time fictional features configure our popular adaptation of historical narratives. Uh, for its part, the so-called audiovisual history has established yet uh, another field of research in recent years. Although aesthetics have uh, remained it a long-standing blind spot in the historiographical uh, observation of source images, uh, some historians have uh, continuously made uh, aware of the necessity of changing the focus when history looks uh, uh, upon images. A change not only aimed at making aware of the potential of audiovisual material itself, uh, but of the nature of historical narration. This signals uh, the possibility for a new kind of understanding, a shift away from the dominance of the written word 
uh, towards the, the, the dominance of the images, which is also the result of, a, a complete, of the completely new opportunities uh, of afforded by researching images. In this context, uh, extensive digital archives uh, providing photographs and audiovisual material from the past have clearly demonstrated how contemporary history benefits from this historical expansion. Uh, two of the most uh, famous examples of this, of this trend are the Shoah Foundation Visual Archive, uh, which uh, or that since the early 90s uh, has been recording testimonies of Holocaust survivors and offering them to the to the research community. Uh, the other, another example could be the Visual History Online Project, uh, which is a reference resource uh, for the historical visual research. At the same time, the amount of audiovisual material produced about our societies and by our societies, the mediatization of our everyday life, a process that has gained exceptional momentum in the last decades generates new challenges if we want to be able to rightly understand, wholly understand the world we live in. Challenges that go beyond the simple reconsideration of audiovisual narrative or uh, of tr traditional historical subjects. So the ubiquity of media, starting by the handheld cameras in 60 millimeter or 8 millimeters in the 60s or 70s, uh, and uh, following with the video cameras and current uh, mobile devices, illustrates the need uh, for to open up uh, new fields of research that can and must be analyzed from the perspective of the audiovisual history. Microhistory, history of everyday life, and indeed, I suppose one could say that in this regard, history and cinema have discovered these both fields at the same time. To sum up, sum up my argument, uh, I would like to say that to think about the past, especially about our recent past, is more than ever to think about the images of this past. The consequences uh, are that we must begin to look at film in its own terms, as Robert Rosenthal pointed out. That means not only as a way to approach the past, uh, to build a relation to the past, but also as a way of exploring how we relate to this past and what it means for us today. Uh, while written history explains or tries to explain uh, this past, uh, audiovisual texts usually illustrate this past. So film functions as a way of aesthetically and narratively shaping the comprehension of history. It does not only translate a certain historical narrative uh, coming mainly from books into images. It's more complex. It conveys historical understanding in audiovisual form. In this way, film shapes images of the world, influences perspectives, and competes with established uh, historiography uh, as well as with other forms of cultural memory techniques. I find, therefore, <coughs> sorry, especially important to stress that visual images require a manner of reading quite different from that developed uh, for the study of written documents. Uh, and that means, of course, we have to take into account the accuracy of historical episodes, the, where, the way these this, this, um, arguments are being constructed, uh, but it, also, it is also of pivotal importance to analyze the way audiovisual narration deals with these facts and how cinematic language organizes these basic elements, the what and the how of a certain narration. On a very basic level, that would mean how are histo histor historical episodes chosen and selected? How are they organized? Which decisions are we making if we employ certain solutions in framing, in lighting, in soundscape, in cutting, which is their relation to certain conventions, to the genres, to styles, uh, or to storytelling? So which are the metaphors we are using? Which are the invention inventions we are employing? Which are the ellipses we are relying on? to make our uh, narration more effective. As historian uh, Hayden White affirms, modern historians ought to be aware that they should recognize that the representations of historical events, 
agents and processes in visual images presupposes the mastery of a lexicon, a grammar and a syntax, in other words, a language, and a discursive mode quite different from that uh, conventionally used for the representation in verbal discourse alone. So uh, now let me conclude these introductory remarks with some examples of the questions and paradoxes posed by the historical representation of the past. To do so, I'm going to refer to three very different audiovisual texts coming from television, from cinema, which, uh, and being documentary films, but also fiction comments, content. Sorry. Uh, I would like to use them to ask some questions regarding our mediated relationship to, to, to the past uh, and to certain historical episodes. My main interest in here is to highlight the importance of critical thinking about certain codes of representation that influ influence not only our knowledge of the past, but also the way we build our relation, relation to this past. The focus lies on the aesthetic solutions some audiovisual texts employ to achieve certain effects on spectators. So the first example is a documentary film uh, made by the French uh, by the French uh, television uh, program, uh, to, um, sorry, uh, French television channel in 2014, commemorating the beginning of World War One in 1914. Um, in this case, original footage was enhanced with color and sound in order to provide a more direct experience of war. This was history happened at present time. However, the same procedure. Uh, which was criticized by some historians as not being accurate enough and ignoring the nature of the original sources. The paradox is in this case that historical reality, I mean this original footage, had to be transformed uh, in order to be more real, so more very similar. Um, the second example, quite different indeed, uh, would be Schindler's List, which is a Kind of a counterexample, I would say. Um, it's uh, as you may probably know. This is a feature film, a historical drama on the Holocaust, uh, which was recorded, which was made by uh, Steven Spielberg in 1993. And um, I find really interesting the way this film uses black and white cinematography in order to increase the historical effect on upon us of the, of the e contemporary newsreel from the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, apart from the artistic consideration of black and white aesthetics, its use was an attempt to offer the spectators a more realistic approach to the images. And this, in this time, the connection uh, to, to the historical facts was enabled by the use of codes regarding the traditional representation of war in those years. Reality was, therefore, in this case, constructed, uh, taking into account certain aesthetic uh, decisions, which generated controversy regarding the classical discussion about the portrait of the unthinkable, that is, about the ethics of a right representation of the Holocaust. Um, Third example is a more current example, uh, you also really know. This is the Netflix fiction series Stranger Things. Uh, it's a kind of a horror science fiction uh, hybrid settled in an American small town of the 1980s. In this case, uh, the relation to the past does not, uh, question, uh, does not raise questions uh, about histori ac historical accuracy, uh, but uh, in the looks, in the clothes, in the hairdos, in the music, and whatever. Uh, but on a mediation based on the images of fiction films from the 1980s. Uh, which may be the reason why these series are so su successful exploiting the nostalgia among its audience. Uh, this is not a series about the 1980s, but about a certain fiction narratives from this era. In this case, the more, <coughs> more interesting than it offers about the past is how much it tells us about ourselves, about the way we look back and in this past, about the aspects that condition this look. Well, thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy my presentation. Have a nice day. Goodbye. <laughs>